Hello friends, a very good evening to all of you. So am I audible and is my screen visible? Please confirm. Good evening. Ronak Shrishta. Yes, am I audible? Okay. So friends, with less than 15 days remaining for the D exam, your NEET PG 2023, I'm sure all of you have, you know, put in enough of your efforts and have are consolidating by revising. So here we have a quick revision of the very important topics from pediatrics for the upcoming NEET PG exam. So uh, we have divided pediatrics into two sessions. So today we'll be dealing with general important topics from general pediatrics and neonatology and tomorrow we'll be covering systemic pediatrics. Okay. So I want this to be an interactive session and uh, more and more participation from your side will motivate me to further, you know, uh, discuss more and more facts with you and help you better prepare for your upcoming exams. Okay, so let's start. Right. So starting with our first question, a 16 month old boy whose weight is 10 kg. Okay, so always whenever you're reading the question, just try to register the important facts that that question is offering. Okay, so 16 month old boy whose weight is 10 kg was brought to the clinic by his mother. Image of growth chart is given to you. Okay, what should be the next step? Whether the child is healthy, reassured, severely malnourished child, refer, severely malnourished, advised mother for home-based care, moderately malnourished, advised mother to feed calorie-dense food. So see, 16-month-old boy, 10 kgs. Let us plot it on the growth chart. So here we have a WHO growth chart, weight for age chart for boys, okay? So 16 months and 10 kgs, right? So let us try to plot it. So this is 16 months, 1 year, 4 months, and 10 kgs is here, right? So, at 16 months, if you see, 10 kgs is here, right? So, it is falling here. So, what is your interpretation? So, this you can see is a blue colored growth chart. So, it is a growth chart for boys and it is a weight for a chart. It is a Z score based chart, okay? Because you have 0 plus 2 plus 3 minus 2 minus 3, right? So, this child's weight is appropriate for his age because it is between, you know, plus 2 and minus 2 Z scores. It is near the 0 line. So, this is appropriate for age. So, what will we do? So, what should be the next step? So, very good. Prasanna, Kajal, Hema, Kafein. No, no, Kafein is wrong. Okay, Jitu, Meena, Shifali. Very good. So, the child is healthy. We will reassure. So we can see that on the growth chart, we plotted it and the uh, weight was falling between plus 2 and minus 2. It was near the zero line. So the child is healthy and we reassure the mother. Okay. Now, moving ahead. So what is your diagnosis based on this growth chart? So here you have a plotting of a child and you can see what is happening here is, you know, the child's weight, the child's height. Okay. Weight and height are there. The weight has been plotted. Height has been plotted. So this is the height of the child. Okay. And you can see that the height of the child is running below the 5th centile. Okay, it is be running below the 5th and 3rd centile throughout childhood. And then the child is catching up and is coming to normal. The final adult height attained is normal. So what is the diagnosis? Can someone give me the diagnosis here? So the height of the child is running less than the 3rd percentile. That means it is the child is having short stature during childhood. But then there is a growth spurt and the ultimate final height attained is normal. So what is the diagnosis? Very good. Very good. Meg, Monica, Kefain, I mean, Shifali. Yes, friends. So this is constitutional delay. So you can get case scenarios and graphs like this. You should be able to identify. Okay. So this is constitutional delay in growth and puberty. You might get an additional history of delay in puberty in the child as well as a history of delay in puberty in the parents can also be there. But remember the final adult height attained is normal is around the 50th percentile here. But what if the growth chart would have remained like this below the third percentile and finally also it remained like this and the parents are also short. Then in that case, it would have been familial short stature. 
if the parents were also short and the child continued to remain short throughout childhood and also the adult height would have been less then it would have been familial short stature okay right now moving on to a quick revision of some important developmental milestones so important gross motor milestones i am sure all of you know it neck control partial neck control develops by 3 months complete neck control develops by 5 months sitting with support will come first without support later so sitting with support comes at around 6 months without support comes at around 8 months right standing with support will come next so it will come around 9 months creeping comes around 10 to 11 months standing without support will come at 12 months walking with support also 12 months okay so sitting standing walking and in between crawling and creeping and walking without support around 13 months rides a tricycle friends very very important milestone 3 years three wheels in a tricycle 3 years right so moving ahead important fine motor milestones hand regard we know comes at around 3 months of age bidextrous grasp comes at around yes bidextrous grasp comes at around 5 months of age right palmer grasp 6 months transfers objects from one hand to another 7 months immature pincer grasp 9 months mature pincer grasp 12 months scribbles spontaneously like this at 15 months tower of 6 to 7 cubes so tower of 6 to 7 cubes will come at what age 2 years very good so 2 years okay handedness appears by 2 years or 24 months and handedness is established by 3 years or 36 months okay so moving to the drawing skills of a child very very important and i am sure all of you know it it is so easy to remember and so so high yielding okay so when you is a child able to copy a straight line yes so a straight line has got two ends so a child is able to copy a straight line at two years when is a child able to copy a circle so circle is a rounded figure like this okay it is round so three years three years three has got round and round like this so three years copies a circle okay very good so a rectangle has got four vertices 1 2 3 4 so copies a rectangle at 4 years child is able to draw oblique lines at 5 years so copies a triangle at 5 years and finally diamond is a bit difficult than triangle so copies a diamond at 6 years right we also need to know some milestones related to use of cubes okay so you can see the child can make a tower of 2 cubes at 15 months of age okay 15 months tower of 2 cubes so number of cubes put in tower after that is equal to 3 times the age okay so remember at 2 years the child can make a tower of 6 cubes 6 to 7 cubes at 3 years the child can make a tower of 9 cubes right now what do you see in the next picture so here this is a train okay a child has made a train without chimney okay train without chimney so a child is able to make a train without chimney at around 2 years of age while train with chimney okay so train with chimney so you can see a train and here a chimney is also there so train with chimney at so you can get image based questions like this okay or you can get arrange in proper sequence in the you know order in which they appear so train with chimney at around 2 and a half years okay now the child can make a bridge you can see this is a bridge okay so there are two cubes and on top of it another cube so a bridge at 3 years okay a child can make a gate using cubes so this is a gate so you can see these are the two bottom pillars these are the side ones and this is in between so this is a gate using cubes so this happens at around 4 years the child is able to do around 4 years and the child is make able to make a step with cubes so you can see a step here okay step ladder pattern so steps using cubes the child is able to make steps at around 5 years okay so these are some milestones related to the cubes which also we should remember right moving ahead to the social milestone social smile we all know comes at around 2 months okay 2 to 3 months mirror play 6 months stranger anxiety comes at around 7 months waves by by very very important again no mistake permissible 9 months plays peekaboo okay peekaboo at 10 months plays a simple ball game 12 months points to objects 15 months domestic mimicry and dry during day time 2 d's at 18 months parallel play at 2 years and joins in play with each other at 3 years okay and the important language milestones the child vocalizes by around 2 months more musical sound that is cooing at 3 months monosyllabic babbling 6 months bisyllabic babbling 9 months two to three words with meaning one year remember one two three so at one year two to three words with meaning 
After that, number of words put in sentences is approximately equal to age in years. So two word sentences, two years, three word sentences, three years. And in between, jargon speech comes at 15 months and 10 words with meaning at 18 months. So very, very easy. These very important milestones we must remember. Right? Now, moving ahead to another question. Yes. So a developmentally normal child. Okay. This child is developmentally normal. Is able to hold an object in front of him with both hands. So holding the object with both hands means bidextrous grasp. Okay. Object with both hands. So bidextrous grasp is there but is not able to hold the object with one hand that means unidextrous or palmar grasp is not there and not able to transfer it from one hand to another so transferring objects is also not there so what is the probable age of this child four months five months six months seven months yes shritha very good it is five months yes priyakshi very good okay so this child's age is five months so at five months we said bidextrous grasp appears that means holding object with both hands at six months, unidextrous grasp will come and transferring object will come at seven months. So this child's developmental age is around five months. Very good. Okay. Now, another very, very important topic asked n number of times in your exam, definition of SAM, severe acute malnutrition. So we all know, in a so how do we define SAM? So in a child between six months to five years of age, presence of any one or more of, one or more of, okay, so weight for height, weight for height less than minus 3z score or less than 70% of expected okay or mid upper arm circumference mid upper arm circumference less than how much 11.5 centimeters or presence of symmetric bipedal edema of nutritional origin okay symmetric bipedal edema so this edema is not because of anything else symmetric bipedal edema of nutritional origin okay right so if any of these is present in a child between six months to five years of age we call it sam severe acute malnutrition now what is this device used to measure so which device is this friends tell me quickly waiting for your answers so it's a rapid fire okay quick 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 so what is this device? So I'm sure all of you are able to identify. This is a measuring tape with red, yellow and green colored zones. And you can already see what is being measured here. Very good. Okay, Ayman, Dr. Sanya, Jitu, Sangeeta, Sana, Neelam. Very good. Darshan, Prakruti. So this is, yes, it is a Shakir's tape which is used to measure the mid-arm circumference. Okay, mid-arm circumference or mid-upper arm circumference is measured using Shakir's tape by the health workers. Okay, so if the mid-arm circumference is falling in the red zone, that means the child is malnourished. Yellow zone means borderline nutritional status and green means normal. Very good. So what is being measured here? What device is it and what is being measured here? Yes, come on. Waiting for your answers. So what device is this? So remember your old physics days where we used to use vernier calipers for measuring the thickness of coins and all? Very good. Dr. Kefain, Surbi, Sanya, Sana. Yes. So this is Harpenden calipers, okay, which is used to measure the skin fold thickness. So Harpenden calipers used to measure the skin fold thickness, okay, skin fold thickness. So this th skin fold thickness is usually measured over the biceps area, triceps area, suprascapular area and subscapular areas. And Tanner's charts were previously used to find the normative values and you will have WHO growth charts also available for skin fold thickness. Okay. Now, moving on to WHO classification of malnutrition, again, very, very important. So see what are the things that we are taking? We are taking weight for height and height for age. Okay. So if the weight for height is between minus 2 to minus 3 Z score, so remember it is weight for height and not weight for age. Okay. So weight for height between minus 2 to minus 3 Z score or between 70 to 79% of expected is called wasting. But if the weight for weight for height of a child is less than minus 3 Z score or less than 70% of expected, then it is called severe wasting. Okay. If the height for age is between minus 2 to minus 3 Z score or between 85 to 89% of expected, what is it called? Yes, height for age between minus 2 to minus 3 Z score or between 85 to 89% of expected, what is it called? Very good Darshan. So it is stunting. While if it is height for age is less than minus 3z score or less than 85% of expected, then it is severe stunting. So again, from a given case scenario, if the anthropometric values are there, you should be able to interpret it. And you add a word edema. Okay. You add, if edema is there, you add the word edematous. So it becomes edematous wasting or edematous stunting if edema is also there. Okay. 
Now remember microcephaly also, the definition of microcephaly is head circumference for age less than minus 3z score of expected and not less than minus 2z score. Okay, that is another definition that you must remember. Okay, now moving ahead to a question, a very simple one, severe acute malnutrition as, as per WHO criteria is. So the options sound confusing. Okay, but once you have it, once you know it, again, you are not going to make any mistake. So is it weight for age less than minus 2z score below the median? or wait for height less than minus 2z score below the median or wait for age less than plus 3z score below the median or wait for height less than minus 3z score below the median. Yes, waiting for your answers. Very good. Ashish, Shipali, Sana, Dinal, Neelam, Dr. Kafein, Sarpraz, Darshan, Vakar, Jaikishan. Very good. So that means all of you are awake. Good. Very, very good. So wait for height less than minus 3z score below median. Now, you, you've often got image based questions like this. So the first child here, can you see that the child is appearing severely malnourished and, you know, emaciated and there is no edema. So what is your diagnosis in the first one? Yes. The first child waiting for your, your reply. What is the very good? Sanya, Shifali, Bharat, Surbi. Very good. So it is marasmus. Okay. While the next child that you see here. So this child, the next child that you see here, this child has got malnutrition with edema. So this is a child who has Quashiorca. So you can see the edema along with malnutrition. So in Quashiorca edema is there because there is more of protein deficiency, of course, along with the calorie deficiency. And the salient features of Quashiorca are very, very important. What are they? The child has edema. The child has poor appetite. So in Quashiorca there is, so in Quashiorca we said there is edema. There is poor appetite. Okay, the child does not want to eat anything at all. So poor appetite. And you know, the child has apathy. The child is listless, uninterested in surroundings. So the child has apathy. The child is listless and uninterested in surroundings. And you can also get fatty hepatomegaly. Okay. So very, very important from a case, case scenario, you should be able to make out whether it is Koshyorkar or Marasmus. Right. Now, an Anganwadi worker, an Anganwadi worker takes weight and height of a four-year-old and finds out that her height for age is less than minus 2 SD or Z score, the likely causes. So when the height is mainly decreasing, what would it be? Would it be chronic undernutrition or acute malnutrition or wasting or recent infections? Yes, waiting for your answers. Yes. So flag sign, flaky pen dermatosis and all are also more common in Quashiorcor than in Marasmus. But the salient features are the three that I told you. Poor appetite, apathy and you know edema. Those are the three salient features that help you diagnose Quashiorcor. Okay. So yes, of course, here the answer is A. So it is chronic malnutrition. So for the height to be affected, you know, the undernutrition or, you know, malnutrition has to be for a long time. Only then the height becomes affected. So, uh, you know, uh, decrease in height for age or stunting is an indicator of chronic malnutrition. While decrease in weight for height or wasting is an indicator of acute malnutrition. Okay. Remember? Right. Which vitamin deficiency gives uh, the following picture? So what you can see here? What do you see in the eye? So we can see the bitot spot, right? The triangular foamy bitot spot. So bitot spot, friends, we all know is due to deficiency of very good. Lakshay, Rao, Sana, Prakruti, Prajakta, Dr. Ravi, XYZ, okay, G2. So it is vitamin A. So we need to remember the various signs and symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. We know the earliest symptom of vitamin A deficiency would be night blindness and the earliest sign of vitamin A deficiency will be conjunctival xerosis. And of course, there are various gradings. Again, the dose of vitamin A is very, very important. So if a child is less than six months age, the dose will be 50,000 units per dose. Okay, six months to one year of age, the dose will be one lakh unit per dose. And more than one year age, the dose is going to be 2 lakh units per dose. And, you know, prophylactic dose, you will give a single dose. But therapeutic dose for a child who already has, you know, signs of vitamin A deficiency, you will give the dose, one dose at diagnosis, repeat the dose 24 hours later and a third dose 2 to 4 weeks later. Okay? Right. Now, which of the following diseases has autosomal recessive inheritance? Is it osteogenesis imperfecta or Tetracolin syndrome, achondroplasia or cystic fibrosis? Yes, let us see who can answer it. Which of the following diseases has autosomal recessive inheritance? We know in autosomal recessive inheritance, both the alleles have to be abnormal for a gene to, for a disease to manifest. Okay. Yes, very good. Again, Darshan, Shifali, Sangeeta, Jitendra, Vikrant, Bharat, Pooja, Neelam, Lakshay, all of you are right. Awesome. So that means your preparations are going in full gear. I mean, really amazed to see that. Very, very good. Okay. 
So osteogenesis imperfecta we know has autosomal dominant inheritance. Tracheocolin also autosomal dominant. Achondroplasia also has autosomal dominant inheritance. And cystic fibrosis which is due to the CFTR gene mutation is an example of autosomal recessive inheritance and hence the answer here, right? Now this is a child with, with yes, any guesses? So this is a child with osteogenesis imperfecta. Can you see the multiple bony deformities which are due to recurrent fractures? These children usually have a large size head and on taking a close look at the eye, what you see here is a blue sclera. Okay, so this is a child with osteogenesis imperfecta. For the treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta, bisphosphonates like pamidronate are used. Okay, now what is the diagnosis here? So this is a child with a genetic syndrome, which we just now mentioned in the previous question. Yes, come on. So this is a child with treacher colon syndrome. Okay. So in your All India exam previously you've had had question on treacher colon syndrome. So these children usually what they have is you know they have anti-mongoloid slant of eyes. They have the lower eyelid coloboma. You can see a defect of the lower eyelid. Okay. Lower eyelid coloboma is there. They have malformed ears associated with deafness. Underdeveloped cheekbones are there. Okay. So these are the usual features of treacher colon syndrome and it has autosomal dominant inheritance, right? Now, this again, what is your diagnosis? Another spotter. So this again, this is a disease which has autosomal dominant inheritance. What you see is that this child has short stature. And if you, you know, try to appreciate the, you will see that, you know, the limbs of the child are much shorter than the trunk. So this is basically short limb dwarfism, short limb dwarfism. Very good, Abhi, Prajakta, Navid. Very good, Foyes, Saint, Dinora, Surbi. Awesome, guys. So, this is a child with achondroplasia, okay? So, this is a child with achondroplasia, which we know has autosomal dominant inheritance. And in this picture, what you see is trident hand, okay? And the last x-ray shows a champagne glass pelvis. So, you can see that the pelvis has shape like this, just like a champagne glass. So, it is a champagne glass pelvis, okay? Now, so autosomal dominant disorders, we have a mnemonic which we can use to remember some of the important ones that is heavy dominant, okay, heavy dominant, right. So you have H for hereditary spherocytosis, E for ehlers danlers A for achondroplasia, V for von Willebrand disease, most of the types, Y is the Y in pseudo hypoparathyroidism, D for dystrophia myotonica, although it shows, you know, autosomal dominant kind of a pattern, but it is a trilinucleotide repeat disorder, O for osteogenesis imperfecta, M for Marfan, I for intermittent porph porphyria, N for neurofibromatosis, another A for adenomatous polyposis coli, okay, which you must have discussed in your pathology, N for Noonan and T for tuberous sclerosis, okay. Moving ahead to some important autosomal recessive disorders. Uh, so with A, you can remember this by the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So with A, you have albinism and alkaptonuria. Alkaptonuria, which enzyme deficiency? So this is again alkaptonuria, very, very important for your questions, has been asked multiple times. So this is a deficiency of homogentesis acid oxidase or homogentisate oxidase, right? So B for beta thalassemia and similar to that, another chronic hemolytic anemia that is sickle cell anemia. C for cystic fibrosis, congenital adrenal hyperplasia or CAH. D for deafness, E for emphysema due to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, F for Friedrich's ataxia, G for Gaucher and galactosemia, H for homocystinuria and I for inborn errors of metabolism. So most of the inborn errors of metabolism have got autosomal recessive inheritance except a few like Fabry disease. Okay, all the types of mucopolysaccharidosis have autosomal recessive inheritance except type 2 or Hunter disease which is X-linked. Okay, very, very important. Moving ahead, the golden rules, how to interpret a pedigree chart? Just remember these four rules. All or most children of an affected mother are affected. So if the mother is affected and all or most of the children are affected, then what kind of inheritance it is? So it is mitochondrial inheritance. So if a mother is affected and all her children are affected, it is mitochondrial inheritance because the baby gets all the mitochondria from the mother, not from the father. At least one of the parents at least one of the parents always has the disorder. So a child is having a disorder, at least one of the parent has that disorder. Then it is what kind of inheritance? Yes, you guessed it right, it is dominant inheritance. Now if both males and females are affected with almost equal frequency, okay, both males and females are affected with almost equal frequency, then it will probably be autosomal, nothing to do with the sex chromosomes, okay. Father to son transmission of a trait does not occur. 
so if you are seeing that father is not able to transmit a trait to the son so father to son transmission of a trait does not occur then it is x linked inheritance because we know father's y chromosome goes to the son and not the x chromosome okay so if father is transmitting a disease to the son that means it is not x linked so father to trans son transmission of trait does not occur in x linked inheritance okay so these are the golden rules using which you can solve any pedigree that you get okay now moving ahead don't get bogged down by the big size of the question and believe me if you try to read point by point and you know see out the important information it is very very simple okay so let's give it a try so a 2 year old girl presents with her third bone fracture so the baby is having recurrent fractures okay within the past several months there is no history or evidence of trauma so there is no history or evidence of trauma okay so that means it is a pathological fracture without any significant you know injury the fracture is happening okay several close family members have been similarly affected so you can see that in this pedigree okay several close family members are affected so you know if this is the girl that we are talking about then the one of the brothers of the girl is also affected the mother is also affected and in the family the grandfather is also affected right and you can see some other aunts and uncles are affected and the cousins are also affected so wherever a child is affected here the parent is also affected one of the parents is affected so this is what kind of inheritance dominant right it is dominant right and you can see that father to son transmission is not occurring so here this is a father and this is not transmitting to the son this is a father this is not transmitting to the so this is transmitting to the son yes so father is transmitting to the son so that means it cannot be x linked it has to be what kind of inheritance so i am waiting for your reply till then we'll read the rest of the question the child is small for her age the sclera are tinged bluish in color that gives you another clue which we already discussed radiograph show generalized osteopenia evidence of multiple fractures both old and new which of the following is the usual mode of inheritance of this disorder very good anu and okay aiman har chohan jitu shrita so yes we are talking about osteogenesis imperfecta and yes we already know the most important mode of inheritance of osteogenesis imperfecta is autosomal dominant and yes the pedigree also supports it you can see that there is a father to son transmission that is occurring father to son transmission is occurring that means it is not x linked it is autosomal and you know one of the parents are also affected so it is autosomal dominant so autosomal dominant disorder very good all of you okay yes nimisha i'll be sharing the pdf don't worry okay but concentrate and try to be interactive and try to you know put in your best and give your maximum attention i'm sure you're going to benefit a lot from it okay so osteogenesis imperfecta types 1 to 5 are autosomal dominant most common it is one of the most common genetic disorders causing osteoporosis and the mutations in call one so collagen genes are there type 1 collagen genes are mutated here the classical triad of osteogenesis imperfecta you have recurrent fractures or bony deformities okay recurrent fractures or bony deformities right blue sclera and deafness so that is the classical triad that you get in osteogenesis imperfecta right now who can tell me what pedigree does this show so what is striking in this pedigree is it is the males who are mainly affected okay and even though males are affected what you can see is this father is not transmitting to son so there is no father to son transmission that is occurring so males are more commonly affected and father to son transmission is not occurring so what kind of inheritance is this very good dr ravi so this is x linked recessive inheritance so father to son transmission is not occurring that means it is x linked and the parents are not affected okay so that means it is recessive and males are more commonly affected in x linked recessive unless we know because they have only one x chromosome and if that is affected then they are going to manifest okay now what is the inheritance pattern being shown here again very very simple it you may have you know a big case scenario attached with it but with this pedigree you know you should be able to unlock that very easily so you can see that this mother is affected and all her children are affected son also daughters also right then you can see that this mother is affected and all her children are affected then this mother is affected all her children are affected this father is affected but the children are not affected okay father affected children not affected what inheritance pattern is this very good puja lakesh sanya dr mohit veer 
वकार जिगर वेरी गुड राहुल गौरव अनाबिया सो दिस इन डीड इज माइटोकॉन्ड्रियल इनहेरिटेंस सो इवन दो इट इज अ बिग इलेबोरेट पेडिग्री बट इफ यू सी इट केयरफुली द डायग्नोस इज लुकिंग एट यू ओके सो मूविंग अहेड वॉट यू हैव हेयर इज अ टेन ईयर ओल्ड गर्ल हु प्रेजेंटेड विद वेब्ड नेक लो पोस्टीरियर हेयर लाइन शील्ड शेप चेस्ट शॉर्ट स्टेचर एंड स्वोल एंड फीट ओके सो यू हैव वेब्ड नेक लूज स्किन पोल्स नियर द नेक लो पोस्टीरियर हेयर लाइन शील्ड शेप चेस्ट शॉर्ट स्टेचर स्वोल एंड फीट यू एस डी एबडोम शो स्मॉल यूट्रस एंड स्ट्री गुनाड सो वॉट इज द प्रोबेबल डायग्नोसिस वेरी वेरी गुड सो दिस इज अ टिपिकल केस सिनारियो नीलम सेन पिंकी Surbhi, Priyanka, Sangeeta, Sudipta, Naveen, Kefain, Malready, very good. So this indeed is a typical case scenario where we, uh, you know, diagnose it as Turner syndrome. So we all know what do you see in the karyotype in Turner syndrome? So what you see here is if you count the total number of chromosomes here, there are forty five instead of forty six, and you have a single X chromosome and no Y chromosome. Okay, so forty five total number of chromosomes instead of forty six, it is forty five. Single X chromosome, no Y chromosome. So that is the karyotype that you get in Turner syndrome. So you should be able to diagnose it from this karyotype picture. And because there is no Y chromosome, Turner syndrome is always seen in females. And females normally have two X chromosomes, so one bar body. But in a in Turner syndrome female, there is only one X chromosome. So bar body will be absent in a female with Turner syndrome. So if you are getting a female where buccal mucosa scraping is taken, you look for bar bodies. Bar bodies are absent. Think of Turner syndrome. Okay. Moving ahead, what is the diagnosis based on the result of the investigation shown below? So now we already know what is the investigation. So this investigation, no points for guessing that it's a karyotype. So what is your diagnosis based on this karyotype? Okay, and going back to the previous question, Meghavi is asking which cardiac anomaly. So you know, in Turner syndrome, the most common heart disease is bicuspid aortic valve. Second most common is coarctation of aorta. So if bicuspid aortic valve is there in the option, that is the best answer. If that is not there, then coarctation of aorta is the best answer. Yes. So coming back to this question, very good, Rahul, Prajakta, Staff, Aurelius, Vikram, very very good observation power. So very good, all of you. Those who have not been able to see, you can see that there are. Three copies of chromosome twenty one here instead of two copies. So this child has got forty seven chromosomes instead of forty six. And can you tell me this is a boy or a girl? Yes. Can anyone tell me this is a boy or a girl with Down syndrome? So this is, this is. So there are two X chromosomes and no Y chromosome. So this is a, no, not a boy, Pooja. So Chirashri, Harsh, Anabia. So this is a girl with Down syndrome. Okay. Girl with Down syndrome, right? So this is forty seven X X and plus twenty one. So one chromosome twenty one is extra here, right? Now, moving on to our next case scenario. So what you have here is a nine year old male child with tall stature. Okay, tall stature. Instead of short, now we've moved to tall stature. Presented with chest pain, palpitation, dyspnea on and off for two years. Eye examination shows ectopia lentis. That means dislocation or subluxation of the lens of the eye. An echocardiogram showed aortic root dilatation. Similar features are present in the father. Probable diagnosis is so father also has similar feature. That means it is autosomal dominant disorder. So very good guys. Akhi, Anabia, Uma, Neelam, Jaimin, Prasanna, Prajakta, Har Chauhan. Very good. So uh, looking at the pictures also, you can see that the first picture here shows. fingers like the you know legs of a spider and that is called arachnodactyly okay arachnodactyly what do you see in the chest here so this is a pectus excavatum as if someone has scooped out something from the chest pectus excavatum and here you see the thumb sign positive so the thumb is protruding so if you fold your thumb like this and make a fist your thumb will not protrude from your you know ulnar side okay so But here you can see that the thumb is protruding out. So this is thumb sign positive. Similarly, there is also a wrist sign positive, which is found in Marfan syndrome. So this tall stature, having cardiac kind of complaints, subluxation of lens of the eye, echocardiogram showing the aortic root dilatation. Father also affected means autosomal dominant inheritance. So this is indeed Marfan syndrome. Okay. So Marfan syndrome. Okay. Very very important. So what is the gene affected? F B N one gene is affected. Okay. F B M one gene. And which codes for fibrillin protein, right? 
Now, a little bit about Fragile X syndrome, another very important disorder. So, normal Fragile X gene has 5 to 40 CGG triplets, okay? Expansion to less than 200 is called pre-mutation. Male carriers for this pre-mutation have tremor and ataxia, okay? Fragile X associated tremor and ataxia. Female carriers have ovarian insufficiency, okay? Now, you, the individuals with pre-mutation can have children with full mutation. And what is full, full mutation for Fragile X syndrome? So, if the CGG repeats, remember CGG repeats more than 200 is Fragile X syndrome. CGG repeats more than 200, Fragile X syndrome. And the gene is the FMR1 gene. This will become hypermethylated, protein production will be lost. And this is a loss of function mutation. Even though there is increase in the number of trinucleotide repeats, the mutation, if you ask me, it is loss of function mutation. Very, very important to have this concept, okay? So, you know what is normal fragile X gene, what is pre-mutation, what is mutation and uh, what is the, you know, more than 200 repeats are required for it to manifest and it is a loss of function mutation, okay, fragile X syndrome. Clinical features, you have got case scenarios on it previously. So, long face, you can see long face, large ears and a prominent square jaw is there. There can be behavioral issues like anxiety and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism. And post-pubertal, so in males, after puberty, you can get large size of the testis or macroarchidism. Hyperextensible finger joints can be there. Sometimes they can be macrocephaly. Affected females can also have varying degrees of intellectual disability or learning disabilities. Okay. Now, we said macroarchidism. How do you measure the size of the testis? So, to measure the size of the testis, there is this device. Who can name this? One chocolate for who names this? And yes, it is called anticipation. Anticipation means the clinical features worsen with every passing generation, okay? Because the number of trinucleotide repeats is going to keep on increasing. Yes, so this is a orchidometer, very, very important. So this is a orchidometer which is used to measure the size of testis. So this is used for pubertal assessment, right? Now, intellectual disability in fragile X syndrome, very important to know some things about it. So the mean IQ in fragile X syndrome is 40 in males, okay? More the number of triple trinucleotide repeats, more significant is the intellectual disability. But remember, only 25% of females with, a, with fragile X syndrome have an IQ below 70. So, fragile X is more common in males, but it's not that it cannot happen in females. If fragile X syndrome is there in females, only 25% have IQ below 70. 25% will have borderline IQ, some will have normal intelligence, but these females can have behavioral issues like learning disabilities, attention deficits and so on. Now, moving to a question about Fragile X syndrome, which has been asked previously. So, true about Fragile X syndrome is, read the options very carefully. So, it is triple nucleotide CAG sequence mutation. So, is it the CAG sequence? No, we know it is CGG repeats and not CAG. 50% females with, meanwhile, I'm waiting for your answers also. Yes, so Ravi, Prajakta, Neelam, Ankita, Hina, Ayman, Jitu, very good. So, 50% females with fragile X syndrome have intellectual disability? No, only 25% have that. Males have IQ around 40? Yes. Gain of function mutation? No, it is a loss of function mutation. So, C is the correct answer here, right? Moving ahead, what we have here is a 2-year-old girl, okay? A 2-year-old girl is brought with abdominal distension. On examination, she is found to have pallor. Multiple petechial spots are there. And splenohepatomegaly, that means the spleen is much more enlarged than liver. Her hemoglobin is 3.8, she, she has severe anemia. TLC is also less 3,500 with neutrophils of 58%, lymphocytes 30, mono 6, eosinophil 6. Platelet count is also low, 34,000. Bone marrow aspirate showed the following picture, which of these enzymes is deficient. So, I am sure all of you are able to identify this cell. Very good, Jigar, Meghavi, Jafreen, Ravi. Okay, very good, everyone. Superb. So, this indeed is a Gauche cell and you can see the typical crumpled paper or wrinkled tissue paper appearance of the cytoplasm. And in Gauche disease, you get, you know, you can get pancytopenia because of the bone marrow infiltration and also because of hypersplenism. There is splenohepatomegaly also and you can see this anemia, TLC is also less, pancytopenia is there, abdominal distension is there, okay, and these Gauche cells in the bone marrow. And Gaucher disease we know is due to deficiency of the enzyme glucocerebrosidase, right? Very good. Now, moving ahead, what you have here is a 12-year-old child with excessive fatigue on exercising who presented to the pediatrics OPD. 
on investigation his cpk was found to be so creatinine phosphokinase level was found to be slightly elevated 680 and urine examination revealed myoglobin urea which of the following enzymes is deficient in this child so adolescent child what you have here is a adolescent child with you know excessive fatigue on exercise and there is some involvement of muscles because of which myoglobin urea is happening and cpk level is also elevated very good so yashwant aishwarya jigar lakesh pinky uma manish sangeeta sania prasanna very good so this is a child with mccardell disease okay mccardell disease is in fact the most common glycogen storage disorder in adolescents and adults and we know it is due to the deficiency of myophosphorylase very good okay so moving ahead what you have here is a 5 year old child a 5 year old child who presented with fever for 6 days and generalized rash on trunk redness and swelling of both palms bilateral non pulled and conjunctivitis and tongue as shown in the picture and what we see here is a strawberry kind of tongue so there is congestion and you know there is appearance of the tongue like strawberry so mucositis is there what is your diagnosis Yes, so very good. Another very important topic: Palak, Manish, Swaroop, Bharat, Pinky, Hina, Aditya, Abhi, Jitu, Sudipta, Anabia, Sanya, Prajakta. Very good. So this is Kawasaki disease. Okay. So what what is the diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki disease? So you need to have fever for more than five days. Okay, high grade fever it is usually along with any four out of the five cream features. What are the cream features? Any four out of the five cream features. So C for conjunctivitis which is bilateral and non purulent r for rash on the trunk okay which is a polymorphous kind of a rash e for edema and erythema of the palms and soles with have which has scaling and all also a for adenopathy or lymphadenopathy you can see posterior cervical is the most common and m for mucosal involvement in the form of strawberry tongue so that is the diagnostic criteria for kawasaki disease very important Henock Shonlin purpura. If you get a history where you are getting a child with palpable purpura, okay, palpable purpura, okay. So there are palpable reddish spots which are mainly on the lower limbs. They can be elsewhere also, but mainly the spots are on the lower limbs. Palpable purpura with any one or more of following. What are they? Abdominal pain, arthritis or arthralgia, okay, arthritis or arthralgia. so these are the clinical features and any evidence of renal involvement renal involvement in the form of you know protein urea or hematuria or they can be deranged urea creatinine and any biopsy showing iga deposition any biopsy showing iga deposition so palpable purpura with any one of these features then your diagnosis is henock shonlin purpura okay right now this again very important topic has been asked multiple times so this is the typical case where you suspect juvenile dermatomyositis what do you see in the first picture so you can see these papular lesions on the knuckles and the interphalangeal joints okay so these are called gotron papules okay so gotron papules and here you see a violaceous hue around the eyelids okay that is called heliotrope rash heliotrope rash so if you are getting gotron papules and heliotrope rash along with symmetric proximal muscle weakness the child has difficulty climbing stairs or getting up from sitting position or combing hairs so symmetric proximal proximal muscle weakness evidence of muscle enzymes elevated like sgot cpk they are elevated emg changes mri showing myositis or muscle biopsy showing you know features of this inflammation then you think of juvenile dermatomyositis okay very important get case scenarios on it so the treatment of kawasaki disease we need to know that for the treatment of kawasaki disease ivig intravenous immunoglobulin is a drug of choice along with that aspirin is used initially high dose followed by low dose and in cases which are not responsive and high grade fever is continuing despite ivig people have also used corticosteroids so corticosteroids may be used but they are the third line of treatment the first line the treatment of choice of course is ivig and untreated cases of kawasaki disease an important complication is coronary artery aneurysm so you need to do serial echocardiogram of these patients okay coronary artery aneurysm now regarding the treatment of henock shonlin purpura again has been asked once so henock shonlin purpura usually is a self limiting illness and usually no treatment is required apart from supportive care so usually self limiting illness and usually no treatment is required apart from supportive care that means if there is pain and all you give nsaids for joint pain 
and you know you give supportive care but in moderate to severe cases where moderate to severe abdominal symptoms are there severe abdominal pain or bleeding from you know gi tract or you know there are severe joint symptoms then you may use corticosteroids okay so usually no treatment is required apart from supportive care but where moderate to severe symptoms are there corticosteroids may be used okay now moving ahead to another very important topic the national immunization schedule of india very very important must know topic all of you must remember okay so at birth we all know what vaccines are to be given so bcg opv zero dose hepatitis b bird dose right six weeks so many vaccines to be given what are they opv1 the rotavirus vaccine first dose pentavalent 1 fractional ipv1 and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine is the latest entry in the national immunization schedule the first dose to be given at six weeks at 10 weeks you have only opv2 rotavirus 2 and penta 2 14 weeks again you have opv3 rota 3 penta 3 fractional ipv second dose and pneumococcal second dose okay very important now 9 to 12 months what all to be given so 9 to 12 months you have to give measles and rubella mr1 pcv booster is to be given and you know japanese encephalitis is endemic areas and there is a latest update from 1st january 2023 okay so from 1st january 2023 an additional dose of fractional ipv is also recommended at nine months so at nine months we add on a fractional ipv okay 16 to 24 months again we know mr2 dpt booster 1 opv booster and japanese encephalitis second dose 5 to 6 years dpt booster 2 and 10 years and 16 years td so that is the national immunization schedule a must must know okay now moving ahead to the next question so let us read it what we have here is multi-dose pentavalent so multi-dose pentavalent vaccine and mr vaccine vials were opened during an immunization session and 5 out of 10 doses were used from each of those vials that day. That means 5 doses are remaining in each of these 2 vials unused. Okay. The cold chain was properly maintained and strict asepsis was followed while withdrawing the vaccines. The expiry date of the vaccine vials is after 3 months. What will you do with these opened vaccine vials? Will you discard both or discard penta use MR? or discard MR, use pentavalent or use both MR and pentavalent in the subsequent sessions. Yes. What is your answer? Keshav, Parvez, Naveed, Vakar, Sangeeta, Manish, you guys are on fire. Okay. So, very good. So, discard MR and use pentavalent because, you know, pentavalent vaccine follows something known as open vial policy. Okay. And according to this open vial policy, Multi-dose, you know, the remaining vaccine doses in multi-dose vials of vaccine can be reused in next immunization sessions up to next 28 days provided certain conditions are met. So, what are the conditions that should be met before, you know, following open vial policy? So, the points to be checked as per the open vial policy are there should be readable and intact label of the vaccine, okay? The expiry date of the vaccine should not be passed. The vaccine vial monitor, the VVM, should be usable. The vaccine should not be visibly frozen. Okay. If the vial is already open, the septum should not be leaking. And date and time of opening of the vial should be mentioned. Because after 28 hour, days, even if some vaccine doses are remaining in the vial, they need to be discarded. So these are the points that need to be followed or that need to be checked as per the open vial policy. And very important to remember which are the vaccines that follow open vial policy, which do not. So, remember the freeze-dried vaccines like BCG, measles or MR and Japanese encephalitis and rotavirus vaccine. In these, you know, you will see the VVM is present on the cap and you open the cap, the VVM goes away. Okay, so that is an indicator that for those vaccines, open vial policy is not applicable. So, open vial policy is not applicable for BCG. Measles or MR, Japanese encephalitis, rotavirus vaccine. But for on, on all other vaccines where, you know, BVM is present on the label like this. For these vaccines like pentavalent vaccine, like injectable polio vaccine. So, open vial policy is applicable. Right? Got it? Okay. Now, this of course we know friends, very very important topic is VVM or vaccine vial monitor. You got image based questions on it and multiple, you know, 
straight forward questions on it also so vaccine vial monitor tells us about the heat damage of the vaccine you can use the vaccine if the you know the inside square is lighter in color if the inside square is lighter in color as compared to the outside circle you can use it but you do not use the vaccine if the you know color of the square and circle becomes the same or if the color of the square is darker than the circle in those conditions you do not use the vaccine so it tells about the heat damage and sometimes you know a number is written here like vvm 7 or vvm 13 what does that mean it means that if that vaccine vial is kept at room temperature 37 degrees celsius it will remain potent for those many days so vvm 7 means if that vaccine vial is kept at room temperature for seven days it will remain potent after that this vvm is going to become like this or like this okay so vvm tells about the heat damage to the vaccine can someone tell me what can tell you about the cold damage to the vaccine that means if a vaccine vial which should not be frozen but it had got accidentally frozen okay when you get the vaccine it is thawed but can you come to know whether some cold damage has happened to the vaccine or not what can you do to do you know come to know that very good so you can do something called shake test okay so you can do the shake test and see if some sediment is depositing then that means the vaccine has had some cold damage okay right now again a straightforward question which vaccine is to be given every year do you think it is hepatitis a vaccine or pneumococcal vaccine or influenza vaccine or chickenpox vaccine so hepatitis a vaccine is normally not a part of the national immunization schedule but iap recommends it to be given if the killed vaccine is given two doses are required if the live vaccine is given six single dose is enough okay pneumococcal vaccine we know the two types are the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine the conjugate vaccine is 13 valent the polysaccharide vaccine is 23 valent okay conjugate vaccine is a part of the national immunization schedule but the polysaccharide vaccine is given only beyond two years of age and only given to the high risk children influenza vaccine interestingly is to be given yes very good flu shots megavi said pervas jigger okay so influenza vaccine because the influenza virus keeps on you know having so many antigenic changes in the form of drifts and shifts so influenza vaccine is made every year based on the circulating strains in that area sometimes twice a year also so influ influenza vaccine should be given every year especially to the high risk population okay chicken box vaccine again is not to be required to be given every year okay now the roots of the vaccine also the site at which the vaccines are given conventionally are fixed so that on taking history you can get an idea about you know which vaccine was taken and you know bcg for the bcg we always look up where do we look up we look up the left upper arm because left upper arm is the area where the bcg is classically given so all the vaccines are recommended at certain particular sites which should be followed so we all know oral polio vaccine rotavirus vaccine vitamin a is to be given orally left upper arm we already mentioned so left side left upper arm bcg is to be given and japanese encephalitis in the endemic areas right upper arm which vaccines are recommended injectable polio vaccine and measles vaccine or measles rubella vaccine okay on the right side okay anterolateral part of the thigh on the right side the pneumococcal vaccine is recommended while on the left side left side hepatitis b bird dose pentavalent and dpt booster so that is how they have you know kind of allocated the areas okay for different vaccines now which of the following vaccines is given at the left upper arm of a baby yes who can tell me left upper arm of the baby do you remember so left upper arm very very easy and very very important to remember even during your clinical postings also you might have seen so bcg scar we look for the bcg scar in the left upper arm so left upper arm is the correct answer bcg okay right very good divya aiman jitu mt jigar sudha prajakta vikrant sana neelam very good okay moving ahead a 5 year old 5 year old unimmunized child developed diphtheria so friends diphtheria still occurs in the unimmunized population so we have to take every effort to you know immunize everyone as much as possible because diphtheria is such a deadly and severe illness so a 5 year old unimmunized child develops diphtheria he has a 3 year old immunized sibling contact who received last booster 18 months back so thankfully this sibling is at least immunized and has received the vaccines up to 18 months so the child must have received how many doses of diphtheria vaccine till now 6 10 14 pentavalent vaccines at 6 week 10 weeks 14 weeks so three doses of diphtheria there 
and the fourth one in the form of booster at 18 months. So this child, the sibling, we are talking about this sibling, this sibling has received four doses of diphtheria containing vaccines till now. So what to do with this sibling? Whether you need to give two doses of polysaccharide vaccine, three doses of conjugate vaccine, single dose of topsoid vaccine or no vaccine needed. Very good. So Dinal, Keshav, RP, Sana, Caffeine, Parvez, Prajakta, Puja Kumari, no vaccine needed for this sibling. So let us see what is the recommendation for the contacts with diphtheria. We already know about diphtheria, the Albert stain. We know sore throat is the most common presentation. Fever may or may not be there. Important, uh, you know, bull neck kind of appearance is there. Unimmunized child, pseudo membrane is there. And, you know, important complications. Myocarditis, very important complication. Most common cause of death in these patients. Airway obstruction can also occur. And there can be neurological complications. Antidiphtheritic serum is a part of the treatment. Now, how do you take care of the contacts of a diphtheria case? You have to isolate and monitor the contacts. Chemo prophylaxis needs to be given and vaccination should be taken care of. Let us discuss how. So, all household contacts and people with intimate respiratory or physical contact with the patient should be closely monitored for the illness in the next 7-day incubation period. Okay. Cultures of their nose, throat and any other cutaneous lesions are performed and they are isolated from the rest of the population okay chemo prophylaxis antimicrobial prophylaxis is recommended regardless of their immunization status so regardless of the immunization status antimicrobial prophylaxis should be given to all the close contacts so single injection of benzathine penicillin g can be given 6 lakh international units im for patients less than 6 years and double the dose for patients more than 6 years or erythromycin can be given or even azithromycin can be used okay what about vaccination Vaccination with DPT or DT or whatever is age appropriate for the child should be given to immunized individuals who have not received. So, should be given to immunized individuals who have not received a booster dose within last 5 years. So, in adults, of course, you are going to use TD. Okay. So, in the last 5 years, if there is no booster dose received, then you have to give TD. Okay. You have to immunize children who have not received their fourth dose or who have received less than three doses of diphtheria containing vaccine. They need to be immunized. But the child in question was three year old and he had received four doses of diphtheria containing vaccine till then. So no further immunization required. Okay. Now, another very, very important topic, fever with rash. You can get multiple case scenarios. A child has high grade fever and you can see if this child with fever with rash has got Conjunctivitis, you can see conjunctivitis, redness of eyes, sticky eyes, watery discharge from the eyes, running nose is there and there is erythematous maculopapular rash which is confluent at places and more on the trunk starting from behind the ears and leaving a brownish discoloration when it goes off. Very good. Sarika, Rao, Dinai, Prasanna, Bharat. So this is typically a child with measles. You should be able to diagnose it and you can get clustering of cases. The siblings may be affected, the contacts or friends may be affected. Okay, they are infectious diseases. Now, in which illness you get such type of rash? So, what rash is this? So, this is a pleomorphic rash where you can see different kinds of rashes at the same time. That means there is a macule also, the papule is also there, vesicle is also there. Some of the rashes are fluid filled and blisters and even crusting is also there. So, pleomorphic rash, very good. Sanya, Manish, Kaushal, Anubhav. Okay, so this is chicken pox or varicella. Okay. Again, fever history will be there. What do you see here? Slap cheek appearance of rash. Slap cheek appearance of rash, where do you get it? Yes. Slap cheek appearance of rash, where do you get it? So, we get it in. Waiting for your reply. So, we get it in. Very good. Sudipta. Okay. So, this is erythema infectiosum, which is due to parvovirus. Okay. And where do you get painful vesicles like this? So, if you get painful vesicles like this, just give me a moment please to put on, plug in my charger. Just give me a moment. So, just a moment please. So if you get painful vesicles like this on the palms, soles, limbs and you know near the oral cavity, oral ulcers are there, blisters are there. So this is very good. So this is hand, foot, mouth disease. Okay. Hand, foot, mouth disease caused by the Coxsackie virus. Okay. Very, very common in school going children. Okay. You have had recently almost epidemics of this. 
Now, moving on to some important topics from neonatology. Okay. So, a mother reported that her baby did not pass urine on postnatal day one. So, mother reported that baby did not pass urine on postnatal day one. What will be the next step? Will you start IV hydration or ship the baby to an ICU and investigate why the baby is not passing urine? Or continue breastfeeding and observe or start formula milk because probably the breast milk is inadequate. What will you do? So very good Shivam, Vakar, Pooja, Manish, Arpi, Sana, Sri Lakshmi. Very good. Nothing to be worried of because you know it is absolutely normal. So this is the Kluharty's textbook of pediatrics. So this says that you know the first urination, the first urination should occur by 48 hours of age. So within first 24 hours, if there has been no urination, no need to be afraid of, continue breastfeeding and observe the child. The first passage of meconium is expected by 24 hours of age. Some of the causes of delayed passage of meconium are, yes, so delayed passage of meconium, you can get in Hirschsprung disease, you can get if there is, you know, intestinal obstruction and all, you can get it, or in cystic fibrosis, you can get delayed passage of meconium, okay? So here, the best answer is continue breastfeeding and observe, that is C, okay? Greenish black stool in neonate is due to. So we know the first stool of the baby is meconium, which is greenish black in color. And meconium contains amniotic fluid, bile salts, lanugo, bile pigments, intestinal epithelial cells, mucus, water, so many things. So this greenish black color of the stool or meconium of the baby is due to, very simple question. Yes, very good. Jigar, Vikram, Tariq, Manish, Neelam, Shireen, Sanya, Shivam, Shifali, bile pigments, right? Now, what does an infant learn to do once this primitive neonatal reflex disappears? So first, which primitive neonatal reflex is this? Can anyone tell me which primitive ne neonatal reflex is this? So can you see the baby has turned the head to one side and that side the upper limb and lower limb has extended. The opposite side upper limb and lower limb has flexed. So you can see that the baby has turned the, so baby has turned the face to this side, right side and the right upper limb and the lower limb are extended and the left upper limb and lower limb are flexed. Right? So what reflex is this? Very good, Sana. So this is Manish, very good, Prajakta. So this is ATNR or asymmetric tonic neck reflex. This ATNR or asymmetric tonic neck reflex appears around 35 weeks of gestation and disappears by 5 to 6 months of age. And only when this reflex will disappear, the baby will learn to roll over. That means prone to supine and supine to prone. So Biodextrose grasp has nothing to do with it. In fact, palmer grasp comes when the palmer grasp reflex disappears. Okay. Rolling over. Yes, rolling over from prone to spine or spine to prone is going to come when the ATNR or asymmetric tonic neck reflex disappears. Okay. Right. Now, which is this primitive neonatal reflex where you get symmetric abduction and extension of the upper limbs followed by adduction and flexion and along with opening of hands was there, movement of lower limbs, extension of the trunk and crying. So this is what reflex is this? Very good. Shubradeep, Manish, Darshan, Pooja, Shivam, very good. So this is Moro's reflex. So Moro's reflex, you know, begins to appear by 28 weeks of gestation, completely appears by 37 weeks of dis uh, gestation and disappears by 5 to 6 months. If the Moro's reflex persists and does not disappear, then it indicates cerebral damage. Okay. And is normally, you know, Moro's reflex is symmetric on both sides. Asymmetric moro reflex you can get in certain conditions. Some neurological conditions like herbs palsy and congenital hemiplegia, and some bone related conditions like fracture clavicle or shoulder joint dislocation you can get asymmetric moro's reflex. Okay. Where can you get absent moro's reflex? Absent moro's reflex you can get in conditions where there is severe hypotonia like Down syndrome. And stage 3 HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So, Moro's reflex, very, very important. Okay. What reflex is this? Where you are touching the angle of mouth of the baby and the baby will turn the mouth to that side and open the mouth to breastfeed. Yes. What reflex is this? So, this is the... Come on, which reflex is this? This appears at 32 weeks gestation and starts disappearing at one month postnatal age. And this is the earliest primitive neonatal reflex to disappear. Very good. So, Bharat, Staff, Aureus, nice name, Vikran, Parvez, Anabia, Pooja Kumari, Manish, yes. So, it is the rooting reflex, okay. The baby is able to breastfeed only after a coordination between the rooting, sucking and swallowing develops, which is usually beyond 34 weeks, okay, of gestation. Now, moving ahead to another important topic, 
a neonate is born by cesarean section did not cry immediately after birth okay the baby had peripheral cyanosis pulse rate of 120 per minute respiration was slow and irregular the baby was floppy and limp and had hardly any movement of limbs there was coughing on oropharyngeal stimulation how much is the apgar score of this baby whether it is 2 4 6 or 8 okay so let us discuss how to calculate apgar score first and then we come back to this question so apgar stands for a for appearance p for pulse rate g for grimace another a for activity and r for respiratory effort so a appearance we give it zero if the appearance is blue or pale one if the baby is pink but the extremities are blue and two if the baby is completely pink pulse rate absent you give a score of zero less than 101 and more than 102 grimace if there is no response to insertion of a oropharyngeal catheter no response then you give it zero grimace is only that means just some change in expression is there then you give it a score of 1 but if the baby starts coughing or sneezing you give it a score of 2 that means it's an active baby activity limp or flaccid you give it a score of 0 give it a score of 1 if there is some flexion of the limbs and if a nice flexed posture and actively moving limbs you give it a score of 2 respiratory effort no effort 0 slow and irregular 1 and normal efforts 2 so coming back to our question let us see what is the apgar score so let us score the baby a p g a r and then we'll see the total score so what about the appearance of this baby so the baby is having peripheral cyanosis that means the baby is otherwise pink but the extremities are blue so for appearance you will give a score of 1 pulse rate is 120 per minute that means it is not uh, absent not less than 100 it is more than 100 so you will give it a score of 2 for g the baby is coughing on oropharyngeal stimulation so coughing or sneezing on oropharyngeal stimulation you give it a score of 2 okay so grimace is 2 a for activity so for activity we saw that the baby is floppy and limp and had limp and had hardly any movement of limbs okay so you give it a score of 0 okay because the baby is you can see totally limp or flaccid okay and our respiratory effort the respiratory efforts are slow and irregular so you give it a score of 1 So what is the apgar score of this baby let us calculate and let us see if any of you have answered correctly so it is dr mayank and akram very very good okay so this is 2 4 and 6 so the apgar score of this baby is 6 okay so torch infection you are telling me to cover so a little bit about torch infection so cmv remains very important because you know congenital cmv is one of the most important causes of sensory neural hearing loss in children congenital cmv remember 80% of the children are going to remain asymptomatic and if the mother has primary cmv infection during pregnancy then more chances of transmission to the baby okay rather than if mother had cmv previously mother has cmv igg positive then less chances of transmission to the baby okay rubella we know congenital rubella the baby is going to have cdc that means cataract deafness congenital heart disease most common congenital heart disease in congenital rubella syndrome is PDA or patent ductus arteriosus least common we know is atrial septal defect okay so these are very very important now moving ahead which score is this can anyone tell me which score is this so here what you are looking at is upper chest retraction lower chest retraction zippy sternal retraction and nasal flare and grunt and again they are given a score of 0 1 or 2 yes can anyone tell me which score is this so very good lakshya so this is a silverman score or it is also called anderson silverman score or silverman anderson score okay so this silverman score is used to quantify respiratory distress in preterm neonates okay respiratory distress in preterm neonates with respiratory distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease so in apgar score we wanted more score more the score apgar score more we were happy so apgar score more than 7 is normal but silverman score it is opposite more the silverman score more is the distress of the baby again silverman score is from 0 to 10 more than 7 indicates severe respiratory distress so this is a score used for preterm babies with respiratory distress what is the name of the score which is used in term babies with respiratory distress any idea so term babies with respiratory distress which score to use so it is downy score okay downy score is used for term babies with respiratory distress okay moving ahead so a term neonate with a birth weight of 2700 grams who is otherwise well and is exclusively breastfed presents for routine evaluation his total serum bilirubin is found to be 12 mg per dl on day 5 what is the management so you can see that the bilirubin is elevated in this baby right 
what will you do whether you start phototherapy or exchange transfusion stop breastfeeding for two days because you know the grandmother feels probably that it is related to breastfeeding no active treatment required yes so vikran darshan rp dinai prajakta mukesh anjali puja kefen jigar very good so no active treatment required so for a otherwise well baby who is exclusively breastfed birth weight is also fine term baby absolutely otherwise fine the bilirubin of 12 mg per dl on day 5 is absolutely normal nothing to be done okay otherwise in adults and children 12 mg per dl bilirubin is like too much okay so you know for deciding whether to give phototherapy to children or not we use actually in practice nomograms like this so for babies who are at low risk okay so for low risk babies this is the line that we use okay this is the line so if the baby's bilirubin is falling above this line only then phototherapy is required okay so see you can see at 48 hours you can see if the bilirubin level is more than 15 at 48 hours if the bilirubin is more than 15 then phototherapy is required and at day 5 of life if the bilirubin level is more than 20 okay day 5 if the bilirubin level is more than 20 only then phototherapy is required otherwise no treatment is required just reassure and continue breastfeeding okay similarly you have nomograms for exchange transfusion also but in your you know in your exam you might not be given these nomograms so some rules of the thumb from a given case scenario how do you decide when whether to do phototherapy or exchange transfusion or not in a otherwise well baby okay in a otherwise well term baby we are talking about okay 24 to 48 hours of age so if the baby is 24 to 48 hours old we will do phototherapy if the bilirubin is more than 15 and exchange transfusion if the bilirubin is more than 20 mg per dl okay this is all mg per dl right 48 to 72 hours we will do phototherapy if the baby's bilirubin is more than 18 and exchange transfusion if the bilirubin is more than 25 more than 72 hours we do phototherapy if the bilirubin is more than 20 exchange transfusion if the bilirubin is more than 25 so these are for otherwise well term neonates okay but for pre term neonates the cutoffs are much lower and for babies with rh incompatibility erythroblastosis fetalis again the cutoffs are much lower again for exchange transfusion remember if any baby is showing features of bilirubin encephalopathy irrespective of the bilirubin level okay whether i mean even if it is not 25 or 20 say if it is 16 and uh, 17 and the baby is showing features of bilirubin encephalopathy then also you need to go ahead with exchange transfusion because once cns damage occurs it is irreversible okay in a baby with rh incompatibility or with erythroblastosis fetalis in a baby with erythroblastosis fetalis or rh incompatibility we do the cord blood cord so you take blood from the umbilical cord and you do the cord blood bilirubin and hemoglobin so if the cord blood bilirubin is more than 5 mg per dl or the cord blood hemoglobin is less than 10 g per dl it is a indication for exchange transfusion okay so in a baby with rh incompatibility or erythroblastosis fetalis we don't wait cord blood bilirubin of even more than 5 or hemoglobin of less than 10 is a indication for exchange transfusion okay now the babies neonates have jaundice so commonly so there is something called physiological jaundice and you should be able to distinguish it from pathological jaundice from a given case scenario so when will you call it physiological jaundice when will you call it pathological remember physiological jaundice never appears in the first 24 hours if any jaundice in a neonate is appearing in the first 24 hours it is always always pathological okay physiological jaundice is always unconjugated so urine is not high colored urine does not stain the diaper and no clay colored or pale colored stools but pathological jaundice can be either unconjugated or conjugated so pathological jaundice you can get pale stool or high colored urine okay again physiological jaundice is not very severe so icterus does not involve the palm and sole but if the palms and soles of any neonate is stained yellow then it is always always pathological okay again clinical jaundice usually does not persist beyond 3 weeks in physiological may persist for longer time in pathological so that is how from a given case scenario you should be able to make out whether it is physiological jaundice or pathological okay now what is being done in this picture what is being checked so you are pressing the sole of the baby and releasing it and seeing something here so what is being checked here yes anyone so this is how we check for yes come on how do we check so this is this is what we are checking for we are checking for neonatal jaundice so you have to blanch the skin so remember in neonates you do not look at their eyes for jaundice no 
you look over the bony problem you look over the forehead you look over the chest abdomen and legs thighs legs and palms and soles you press the area so that you know the pink neonate is there so the blood will move away and you can see if there is any yellowish tinges there or not so that is how you blanch the areas and look for neonatal jaundice and if the neonatal jaundice is staining the palms and soles it is always always pathological like in this case right that you see here now what is being given to the baby here so the baby is under a blue light here so what is this called so this is phototherapy okay where light is used for treatment the most effective wavelength of phototherapy is 450 to 460 nanometers so any range that is including that range you choose it what is the most important mechanism by which this treatment acts yes whether it is structural isomerization structural oxidation photoisomerization photooxidation prasanna anjali jigar rp neelam shobe barat kafein come on i want an answer from everyone yes so this is phototherapy and the most important mechanism by which it acts is structural isomerization and what else can you do to increase the effectiveness of phototherapy led machines are more led lights are more effective than the cfl lights and you can decrease the distance you can bring the phototherapy unit closer to the baby then it will be more effective and you know more the exposed surface area of the baby more effective is the phototherapy so the baby is to be lying naked below the phototherapy machine only the eyes are covered and the genitalia are covered what are the important adverse effects of phototherapy you've got questions on that bronze baby syndrome a very important adverse effect of phototherapy right apart from that you cover the eyes because retinal toxicity is possible you cover the genitalia because gonadal toxicity or mutations are possible apart from that watery diarrhea dehydration hypocalcemia okay impaired maternal child bonding these are also some of the adverse effects of phototherapy okay now the next question a male neonate delivered at 30 weeks gestation presented with severe distress immediately after birth so a preterm neonate is there preterm neonate is a neonate who is born at less than 37 completed weeks of gestation okay so a male neonate at 30 weeks gestation severe respiratory distress immediately after birth requiring intubation his chest x-ray picture is shown this condition is due to deficiency of a substance produced by which of the following cells type 1 alveolar cell type 2 alveolar cell alveolar capillary endothelial cells bronchial mucosal epithelial cells yes so this x-ray is clearly showing a ground glass appearance can you see the ground glass appearance of the lung fields right because you know there is less air in the alveoli so the lungs are appearing less black and there is presence of air bronchogram can you see the air bronchogram can you see here the air bronchogram there is these black areas here right so these are air bronchogram there is presence of air bronchogram because there is no problem with the bronchus and bronchioles there is air present in the bronchus and bronchioles right so air bronchogram is present so the diagnosis here in your preterm baby preterm baby with severe respiratory distress soon after birth with the chest x-ray showing ground glass opacity and air bronchogram the diagnosis is respiratory distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease right and this is due to the deficiency of mature surfactant and surfactant is produced by which type of cell so we all know it is come on waiting for your answers so which which uh, a b c or d which is the correct answer yes guys so surfactant we know is produced by type 2 alveolar cells very good sudhar selvi okay kafein kalyani darshan so type 2 alveolar cells right so that is the correct answer here now regarding high risk infants all of the following are risk factors except so previously also you've got multiple times questions on high risk infant okay so all of the following are risk factors except so let us see previous history of prematurity small for gestational age neonate more than three years between two pregnancies vaginal bleeding during pregnancy so all of the following are risk factors don't miss the word except okay so let us see first some risk factors for high risk infant high risk infant means any baby who has more chance of morbidity or mortality compared to any other normal baby okay so high risk infant the risk factors are some maternal factors like mother's age less than 16 or more than 40 if the mother is having some illicit drug use poverty in the mother short interpregnancy time of less than so no recommended interpregnancy time should be ideally at least 18 to 24 months okay so if the uh, interpregnancy time is less than two years then it is a high risk okay so maternal diseases like diabetes hypertension rheumatological illness in the mother Factors related to previous pregnancy. In the previous pregnancy, if there has been some intrauterine death or intrauterine growth restriction or prematurity in previous pregnancy, high drops, congenital malformation, metabolic errors in previous pregnancy, they are also risk factors for high risk infant. Factors related to present pregnancy, if there has been vaginal bleeding, multiple gestation like twin or triplets, 
प्री एक्लैम्पिया प्री मेच्योर अपच मेम्ब्रेन पॉली और ओलिगो हाइड्रामियोस ऑफ नॉर्मलिटीज ऑफ द लाइकर प्री मेच्योर अपोज डेटर लेबर फीटल डिस्ट्रेस ब्रीच प्रेजेंटेशन मेकोनियम सेंड लाइकर फॉर्सेप्स और सिजेर डिलीवरी ऑल दीज आर रिस्क फैक्टर्स रिलेटेड टू द प्रेजेंट प्रेगनेंसी एंड रिस्क फैक्टर्स रिलेटेड टू द न्यूनेट न्यूनेट्स बर्थ वेट इज लेस दैन टू थाउजेंड और मोर दैन फोर थाउजेंड प्री टर्म और पोस्ट टर्म बेबी स्मॉल फॉर डेट और लार्ज फॉर डेट बेबी बेबी विद रेस्पेक्ट डिस्ट्रेस कंजेंटल मैलफॉर्मेशन और हैविंग पैलर प्लेथोरा और पेटिकेट सो दीज आर रिस्क फैक्टर्स फॉर हाई रिस्क इन्फेंट सो कमिंग बैक टू आर क्वेश्चन सो रिगार्डिंग हाई रिस्क इन्फेंट ऑल ऑफ द फॉलोइंग आर रिस्क फैक्टर्स एक्सेप्ट सो प्रीवियस हिस्ट्री ऑफ प्री मेचोरिटी येस इट इज अ रिस्क फैक्टर स्मॉल फॉर जेस्टेशन एज एंड लार्ज फॉर डेट यू नो आर रिस्क फैक्टर मोर देन थ्री ईयर्स बिटवीन टू प्रेगनेंसीज इज नॉट अ रिस्क फैक्टर इनफैक्ट लेस देन टू ईयर्स बिटवीन प्रेगनेंसीज इज अ रिस्क फैक्टर ओके सो दिस इज नॉट अ रिस्क फैक्टर वजाइनल ब्लीडिंग ड्यूरिंग द प्रेगनेंसी इज अ रिस्क फैक्टर सो हाई रिस्क इन्फेंट यू नीड टू नो सम मेटर्नल रिस्क फैक्टर्स मदर्स एज पॉवर्टी सोशो इकनॉमिक कंडीशन मटर्नल डिजीजेस फैक्टर्स रिलेटेड टू प्रीवियस प्रेगनेंसी दर्ज बीन एनी अबनॉर्मिलिटी लाइक इंटरट्रेन डेथ रेस्ट्रिक्शन प्री मेचोरिटी हाइड्रॉप्स एक्सेट्रा फैक्टर्स रिलेटेड टू प्रेजेंट प्रेगनेंसी अबनॉर्मिलिटीज ऑफ लाइकर वेजाइनल ब्लीडिंग मल्टीपल जिस्टेशन ब्रीच मेकोनियम सेन एंड सो ऑन एनी अबनॉर्मिलिटी and factors related to the neonate whether baby's weight is less than expected more than expected pre term post term congenital malformations and so on okay now a neonate was found to have a heart rate of 80 per minute at birth what will you do next yes come on so a baby is born and you see the heart rate is 80 per minute that means less than 100 per minute what will you do immediately will you give chest compressions give oxygen umbilical vein catheterization or bag and mask ventilation Yes. What will you do? Waiting for your answers. Kalyani, very good. So Shrita, Prajakta, Anand, Hina, Darshan, Kapil, Uma, Vishwa, Benival, very good. So what we'll do is bag and mass ventilation. So in the neonatal resuscitation algorithm, let us go through it first. Then we'll come back to the question. So first is antenatal counseling, team briefing, and equipment check. Then is the birth of the baby. We ask question three questions: term gestation or not, good tone or not, breathing or crying or not. If the answer to all of these is yes, the baby gets routine care and stays with the mother. If the baby, if the answer to any of these is no, then you stimulate the baby and you assess. If there is apnea, that means the baby is not breathing or gasping or the heart rate below hundred per minute, like in the question here. then you start positive pressure ventilation and how do you give positive pressure ventilation using a bag and a mask and you monitor the saturation and consider ecg monitor so remember when you are starting positive pressure ventilation we start with room air that means 21% oxygen additional oxygen is not required in term units when you start positive pressure ventilation then you reassess after 30 seconds if the heart rate is still below 100 per minute you take ventilation corrective steps okay so you check the mask you readjust it make the seal properly okay maintain the airway and so on and you can use a endotracheal intubation here again you reassess if the heart rate is less than 60 per minute only then you start chest compressions and you continue positive pressure ventilation and only then you use 100% oxygen okay and if still the heart rate continues to be less than 60 you give iv epinephrine the dose of epinephrine we know is 0.01 mg per kg per dose or 0.1 ml per kg per dose of 1 in 10000 epinephrine that is the dilution that we use the saturation targets we must remember at 1 minute the target saturation is only 60 to 65% then go on increasing by 5% that means 2 minutes 65 to 70% 3 minutes 70 to 75 and so on at 10 minutes the target saturation is 85 to 95% so no way we want a saturation of 100% okay so and one more thing whenever you suction the airway of the baby normally suction is not required lot of secretions are there then you suction but always it is m followed by mn so m comes first so suction the mouth first n comes later so suction the nose later this was also asked once okay so moving back to question so if the neonate was found to have a heart rate of 80 per minute that means heart rate less than 100 per minute will you give chest compression no we will give chest compression only if the heart rate is less than 60 per minute and when you give the chest compression what is the ratio of chest compression is to positive pressure ventilation very very important what is the ratio of chest compression and positive pressure ventilation in a neonate during neonatal resuscitation yes come on waiting for your answers the ratio of chest compressions is to positive pressure ventilation in a neonate during neonatal resuscitation i am waiting for your answers will you give oxygen here no we will not give because we start positive pressure ventilation with room air and umbilical vein catheterization not required at this stage only when we need to give some drugs we'll give that yes very good shritha rp lakesh prajakta neelam so it is 3 to 1 and nothing else in neonatal resuscitation okay now so this is the device this is the bag and mask that is used for neonatal resuscitation so you can see this is a this is a self inflating bag that means you uh, 
uh, you uh, squeeze the bag and when you release it, even if you have not connected any oxygen or anything, the bag will get inflated on its own. So it is a self-inflating bag and this is a mask and this is the oxygen tubings and this bag-like thing is called a reservoir. The function of this reservoir is to increase the oxygen delivered to the baby. Okay. And when you do bag and mask ventilation alone, you do it at the rate of 40 to 60 per minute. Right. Can you tell me one absolute contraindication of bag and mask ventilation? One absolute contraindication of bag and mask ventilation. A chocolate to one who answers this. So absolute contraindication of bag and mask ventilation. Very, very, very important. Is very good Meghavi. Caffeine, Shareen. So requesting your friends to please give chocolate to you. Okay, RP, Prashiv, Rohit, Tejasvi. Very good. So the absolute contraindication to bag and mask ventilation is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And the X-ray, chest X-ray in congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a spotter which you must, must be able to identify. So you can see that the bowel gas shadows are there in the thorax here. And you cannot see the diaphragmatic outline here. The bowel gas has, the bowel loops have moved to the thorax and there has been mediational shift to the opposite side. So you can see bowel gas shadows in the thorax, the diaphragmatic outline is not clear and there is mediastinal shift, the baby will have respiratory distress, okay? And here instead of improving, the baby's condition will worsen if you do bag and mask ventilation. If at all ventilation is required, you intubate the baby and do bag and tube ventilation here. And also put in a orogastric tube so that the stomach is decompressed. Stomach and bowel loops are decompressed. Now what do you mean by essential newborn care? Essential newborn care is the immediate care at birth. This includes thermal care, ma maintaining the temperature of the baby. The normal temperature we know is more 36.5 to 37 degrees Celsius. Less than 36.5 degrees Celsius in a neonate axillary temperature is called hypothermia. Severe hypothermia is less than 32 degrees Celsius. Very important. And 36 to 36.5 degrees Celsius is cold stress. Okay. Resuscitation when needed. Support for breast milk feeding. Nurturing care. So breast milk should be started within one hour of delivery. Irrespective of whether it is a cesarean section or a vaginal delivery and exclusive breastfeeding for at least six months complementary feeding started after that so exclusive breastfeeding for six months not at least exclusive breastfeeding for six months and you start complementary feeding at six months continue breastfeeding till at least two years of age infection prevention assessment of health problems recognition response to danger signs and safe referral when needed okay which of the following is not included in essential newborn care drying the baby breastfeeding ear care temperature maintenance yes waiting for your reply which of the following is not included in essential newborn care come on tell me waiting for your answers which of the following is not included in essential newborn care very good prajakta afia shobe rp kalyani shefali so ear care is not a part of it okay but eye care and you know drying the baby cord care all those are part what is this device used to keep the babies warm so you can see this is an open system and on top of it this is a overhead radio overhead you know heating unit is there so what is and the baby is kept here so baby is kept here in this bassinet what is this device? Yes, anyone, what is the use of, what is the name of this device which is used to keep babies warm? So this is open care system. It is known as a radiant warmer. And the method by which the baby gets heated here is radiation. Okay. What is this device? Where, you know, a transparent box-like thing is there inside the baby, inside that the baby is kept. This is specially useful for preterm babies. So what is this device called? So this device is called a, yes, what is the name of this device? So we need to dry the baby to prevent the losses due to evaporation. Otherwise, all the fluid will evaporate and further take away the heat from the baby. Okay. Very good, friends. So Manish, Biprajit. So I can see new people answering now. Very good. Dr. Rao. Okay. Akram, Sana, Bakar. Okay. So this is an incubator. And what is the mechanism by which the baby gets heated in an incubator? The most important mechanism by which the baby gets heated in an incubator is? That is another question. Very good, Shrita. And caffeine. So that is convection. Okay right so what is being done in this picture so the mother has kept the baby in skin to skin contact inside the clothing of the mother so what is being done here so this technique is to be done for all stable low birth weight babies okay and this helps in decreasing neonatal mortality decreasing neonatal hypothermia promotes exclusive breastfeeding okay and you know it uh, decreases the risk of nosocomial infections so kangaroo mother care the components of kangaroo mother care are skin to skin contact, exclusive breastfeeding, early discharge from hospital. Okay. Now, probably the last question. So, for the day, a baby born at 34 weeks gestation, so preterm birth, was found to have feed intolerance and abdominal distension at 72 hours. Okay. Of life, the baby was found to have thrombocytopenia, metabolic acidosis, hyponatremia. Abdominal X ray of the baby is compatible with which stage of NEC. So, we, here we are talking about necrotizing enterocolitis. 
So necrotizing enterocolitis is mainly seen in preterm babies. However, 10% cases may be seen in term babies also. Prematurity, very important risk factor. The important risk factors are use of formula feeding, lack of breastfeeding, maternal cocaine abuse, and absent or reversed endiastolic flow is also in the umbilical artery is also a risk factor. So this baby was found to have feed intolerance, abdominal distension, and the classical triad of investigations that is seen in necrotizing enterocolitis is thrombocytopenia, metabolic acidosis and hyponatremia. That is the classical triad of necrotizing enterocolitis has been asked previously in one of the questions. So every question that we are discovering, we are co we are, the, every question that we are discussing, we are covering at least four to five questions here, right? So which uh, stage is it compatible with? Stage 1B, 2A, 2B, 3B. What do you see in the x-ray here? So in this x-ray, what you can see is, can you appreciate that there is, you know, double outline of the intestine okay that means there is air in the wall of the intestine so normally air is always present in the lumen of the intestine but if air is also present so you can see the wall has bifurcated so if the air is present in the wall of the intestine it is known as pneumatosis intestinalis pneumatosis intestinalis so you can see double outline of the intestine so air in the wall of the intestine not just the lumen so pneumatosis intestinalis is diagnostic of which stage of NEC? So very good, Sheetal, Avinash, Dr. Rao, Caffeine. So it is diagnostic of stage 2A NEC, pneumatosis intestinalis. So stage 1B, usually no x-ray findings are there. 1A, occult blood in stool is positive. 1B, fresh blood in stool is positive. Okay, no diagnostic x-ray findings in stage 1. Stage 2A, you get pneumatosis intestinalis. Stage 2B, what do you get? You get portal vein gas. Okay, portal vein gas. Okay, stage 2B, portal vein gas. And stage 3B is the most severe stage where the intestine perforates and you get something known as pneumoperitoneum. So, stage 3B, you get pneumoperitoneum or football sign. Okay, because of intestinal perforation. Okay. And the baby for NEC, the baby is to be kept nilparolal, start IV fluids, start IV antibiotics for stage 3B where the intestine has perforated, even surgery is required, apart from the supportive care, of course. So what do you see in this x-ray here? The most severe stage of NEC where the intestine has perforated and what you see here is free gas below the diaphragm. You can see free air under the diaphragm. Between the liver shadow and the diaphragm, can you see a black area? So gas under the diaphragm or pneumoperitoneum because of intestinal perforation. In NEC, it is seen in stage 3B of NEC, the most severe stage of NEC. In older children also, if there is intestinal perforation, you can get this free gas below the diaphragm. So you can see gas shadow between the diaphragm and the liver outline. Okay, so this is the most severe stage of NEC where surgical correction is required. Okay. So that is all from me today. So we have discussed some very, very important topics from general pediatrics and neonatology today. See you again tomorrow at the same time. We'll be discussing some important topics from systemic pediatrics. If you have any queries, you can reach out to me on my Instagram handle or you can email it to me or you can mention the comments below. Do let me know how you like the session, okay? And whether you benefited from it or not. Your comments would be really very helpful and motivating for me. So all the very best. Again, we will meet tomorrow to discuss the rest of the important topics from systemic pediatrics. Do go through this video once again, friends, and it will, you know, help you answer almost any question that you get from your general pediatrics and neonatology. Very, very important topics. Just read through and, you know, listen to every single fact that we've covered with so many questions. I'm sure, sure, sure you'll be benefited from it. And uh, do let me know your feedback. It is very, very important for me. And all the very best. See you tomorrow at the same time. And we'll be discussing some very important topics from systemic pediatrics. So till then, goodbye. Take care. God bless you.